where we set up our company, we used to spend our weekend making beers at home. So we used to make beers in our garage. And we basically couldn't find any beers that we wanted to drink in the, in the UK. So the UK beer market was completely dominated by the faceless, generic, multinational, monolithic, industrial corporations that make such goddamn awful liquid cardboard, chemically enhanced beer, and spend so much money in marketing and advertising trying to brainwash poor consumers into thinking that's what good beer is. And sadly in the UK, 99% of people think that beer is something you go out you drink 10 pints of something that's cold, it's planned, it's insipid, it's apathetic, and you fall over, you have a kebab, and you take Saturday night off your to-do list. And we didn't buy into that at all. And at the other end of the spectrum in the UK, you do get some small beer companies, but the, the small beer companies tend to be quite stuffy, quite boring, quite traditional, quite old-fashioned, their target market seems to be kind of weird guys in their 50s that hang out at train stations at the weekend, so we just didn't like the UK beer market at all, so we spent our weekends listening to punk music in our garage and making poppy, exciting, full flavor beers. And in uh, 2006, we got the opportunity to meet Michael Jackson. Uh, Michael Jackson, the King of Pop, as opposed to Michael Jackson, the King of Pop, which would have been good too, but uh, Michael Jackson, uh, before he sadly passed away, was the world's foremost beer and whiskey expert. So we uh, met Michael Jackson down in London and let him taste one of these beers that we'd be making, we'd be making at home, and we were like, oh my god, this is Michael Jackson tasting a beer that we, we made at home, and he tasted it. And I looked at it quite sternly, put the glass down, shook his head and said, boy, quit your jobs and start making beer. So we thought, what the hell, if Michael Jackson saying that to us, then let's do it. So we were uh, 24 years old at the time. At that time, I was like the captain of a North Atlantic fishing boat. So I stopped working on the boat, I put a suit on, I went to the bank, I sold them supplies and they gave me a loan, which was enough to buy some, uh, buy some equipment. So we set up our business in £25,000, which in Singapore dollars is equivalent to about six or seven billion, I think. I'm kidding, it's 50000 Singapore dollars. So, um, all the equipment that we bought was second hand, uh, we bought some old dairy plants, and we set the facility up ourselves, so it was very much egg, porno, bootleg, barter, just to get the facility. Stuff. And when we were setting it up, we did everything ourselves. So I remember one day I managed to electrocute myself and fall off a ladder in the same day, as just because we had no money to pay for people to come in and do the work for us. But we're so excited to be finally making beer. And our biggest goal when we set up the business, and it's still our biggest goal today, is just to make other people as passionate about good beer as we are and show people there is an alternative to this mainstream beers which dominate the which dominate the market in the UK. And the first six months was just tough. It was just myself and Martin who I set the business up with and uh, also the dog who the company's named after and we would do everything ourselves. So we we made the beer, we bottled the beer by hand, we put caps on by hand, we did the hanks, we did the deliveries, we slept and slept some all from the floor, we we did everything back in 2007, just the, just the two of us. And it was tough for us to sell the beers that we were making in the northeast of Scotland. And people in the northeast of Scotland weren't used to big, poppy, full flavour beers, and most of the pubs were owned by the big beer companies. So even if the pub owner wanted to buy the beer, he couldn't because he had a contract with with uh, tenants, with Belhaven, with InBev, with Satan with good weather, so it's tough for us to, to sell the beers there. And I remember one day, it was about five months in, um, I'd been driving the van the whole day, I think I sold two cases, we were losing money, and I went into a local pub and gave him my best sales pitch, I told him about our IPA, told him how it was artisanal, told him about the hops that we used in there, and the, the pub owner just tasted it and spat it back in the glass and said that he I don't like any beer that's got hops in it. And I think, well, am I going to argue with them or am I just going to walk out and wonder why I quit a nice job in a fishing boat to do this? And uh, for the first six months for us were 
were tough, but we never changed the type of beers that we were making or what our mission was as a, a company. And things started picking up with us when we um, entered a Tesco beer competition. Tesco are a, a big supermarket in the UK. So we uh, entered a Tesco beer competition at a time that we were selling maybe 10 cases a, 10 cases a week. I sent the samples away, I forgot about it, and then a month later I got a phone call and this was uh, Tesco. And uh, Tesco told me that we'd finished first, second, third and fourth in the beer competition. Awesome. So uh, I put my suit on again, I went down to London to meet the, to meet the Tesco people. And they were like, well, because you've won this competition, we want to list um, all these beers in 450 stores nationwide. We're going to do um, a thousand cases a week, this and that. And I sat there with my best poker face. Yes, that's good, that's good. And didn't let on at all that we were two humans and a dog filling bottles by hand. But like, yeah, three months, contract perfect, let's, let's do it. So I got back and we had to devise a plan. There's no way we could sell to, to Tesco still in bottles by hand, it just wouldn't work. So I went to our bank, which was um, Bank of Scotland, and I said to the guys there, we've got this amazing deal with Tesco, but I'm gonna need a hundred thousand pounds for a bottling machine, I'm gonna need a hundred thousand pounds for a new fermentation tank, but look how much beer we're gonna sell. This is gonna be awesome, please give me the money. And, and the bank just laughed at me because James, you've been going for six months, you're losing money, there's no way we can give you we can give you more money. Okay. So I went out of the bank and went to the bank next door, which was the uh, HSBC. And I went in there and had a meeting and I said to the guys at HSBC, our bank have just offered us an amazing finance package on a bottling line and some fermentation tanks, but if you guys can match it, uh, we'll think about shifting our bank into you. And they did. So uh, our business plan for the first year was basically make big coffee beers and tell lies to tell lies to banks with suits on. It's gonna it's gonna work for us. It was definitely been quite controversial on a few of the things that we've done as a company, and that's gonna extend to everything that we do. And the UK beer market is quite quite stuffy, quite conservative, quite old fashioned. So we wanted to do something that was a bit more edgy and and fun, but we've perhaps been guilty of overstepping the mark on a, a few occasions. And um, because in the last few years we've managed to develop our business a lot, we now have uh, 65 employees, we do about a million bottles a month. Because we've grown our business a lot, we do quite well in uh, business competitions. So we won a uh, um, start-up business competition for Scotland. And because we won this uh, Scottish competition, we got shortlisted for the UK competition. So Martin and I went down to London to meet this panel of judges. And the, the judging panel was fantastic. There was the head of Google from the UK, a few politicians, head of HSBC Bank, and also a feminist on the judging panel. So uh, we get there and we're giving them a speech about our beers and telling them about our company and uh, we also pass out some bottles of our beer for the people to have a look at and um, we've got a blonde beer and the packaging makes reference perhaps ill-advisedly to uh, save the whale lesbos which we thought was kind of funny and a bit quirky but whatever so we're speaking about our beers and as we're speaking the feminist sees this in the packaging and she's, she's not happy at all so she, uh, she says, guys, stop. How can you come down here? How can you speak about being a, a modern company in 2010 when you're offending women? You can't just speak about lesbians in your, in your packaging. And uh, I was about to start speaking, but Martin, my, my business partner, was sitting beside me. And um, he, he started speaking before I did. And he said, uh, listen, love which is never a good start with a feminist, I'll be honest with you. So then, listen love, don't for a second think that I hate lesbians. In fact, I've got some DVDs at home, just lesbians. <laughs> and needless to say, we didn't win the competition, which sucked because we would have won 5,000 pounds, so it was, a, it was quite disappointing for us. 
So, um, beer has been made now for about 10,000 years. I should have Googled that. About 10,000 years. We'll go with that. But for me, the beer market is, uh, is changing. And I think that the next 10... Oh, no time. I'll stop. I've got one hour left, or how long? Two hours. Two minutes. Wow. Okay. So I think in the I think in the next um, I think in the next ten years we're going to see a massive change in the beer market. I think people are becoming disillusioned with the generic industrial beers. People are becoming more aware of what they consume, of how it's made, of the flavours it presents, uh, and people are looking for things which are different, which are artisanal, and I think. Craft beer definitely fills, fills that gap, so we're seeing more and more people look for better quality beer. So I think there's going to be a huge shift towards the craft beer section of the section of the market. Um, I'm just going to leave you with one uh, with one quick um, anecdote. Um, I was fortunate enough last year to be named um, Young Scottish Businessman of the Year, but I was quite surprised that I got this um, accolade. I was filling out the entry for him. It was late at night, so it was about midnight. I'd been up since um, 6 o'clock that morning trying to fix the bottling machine and I just wanted to go to bed and I got to um, I got to question 10. Can I go back to this? Cool. So I was filling out this form late at night and I got to question 10. Question 10 was as you can see there, in less than 300 words, corporate social nasty. So at that stage, we were a three-year-old company. We weren't adopting baby pandas, although that would be fun. We weren't helping old women do their shopping. And we weren't saving their day for this. We weren't doing anything like that. But at the same time, I wanted to, I wanted to do well in this competition. So I thought, do I make something up? Do I fudge it? Should I be honest? Um, what should I do here? So at midnight I was caught in this kind of late night ethical, moral dilemma when I just wanted to go to bed. So I ended up typing something quite harsh in the box, pushing the send button and uh, going to bed. So this is what I typed. <laughs> so maybe slightly too honest, but I thought it kind of summed up what we, what we thought about it. So anyway, um, and we actually won the Scottish Award despite that answer. And afterwards, I spoke to the judges. I was like, what the hell were you thinking? Did you not see the answer to question 10? And they were like, yeah, we got a punky, edgy company. We got it to school. Fine. So because we won the Scottish Award, we got shortlisted for the European one. And um, unfortunately, I was away in business. So Martin, who I set the business up with, had to fly to Italy and to Rome, ironically, near the Vatican meet this European panel of judges to these young European businessmen. So Martin put on his suit, he got a PowerPoint presentation and he went out to meet the judges and the judging panel this time was phenomenal. There was heads of state, the president of Romania, amazing judging panel. The only thing was that Martin knew nothing about this entry form that I filled in a, a few months before. So Martin gets there and he's giving his talk and he's speaking about hops and beers and getting quite into it and as he's speaking the judges are sitting there nonchalantly looking at these um the entry forms. So the president of the media, God bless him, the first guy to get to question ten and he sees the answer and he's uh, he's not happy at all. Um, but to make matters worse, his English wasn't that good. So as opposed to him reading the sentence to mean I'm not saintly good, he read the sentence to mean I'm not having intimate relations with a dead international peace icon. Um, his exact words to Martin were, stop, stop young man, why do you know fuck Mother Teresa? Which is uh, not ideal when you're doing a presentation, I'll be honest. But Martin was then asked to leave and uh, we didn't win the business competition. And this is perhaps the most um, controversial thing that we've done. We made a 55% beer, and with the packaging, we wanted to fuse the three things that we're most passionate about, which is uh, beer, art, and uh, taxidermy. So the whole thing was designed to challenge people's perceptions about what beer is, how it can be enjoyed, how it can be packaged, how it can be served. So actually, packaged the beer in uh, the road stall, which was quite, which was quite interesting.
Anyway, there's a quick video. Um, we like to make a lot of videos on our website, so there's a quick video to finish with. I'm going to be hanging about all day, so if anyone's got any questions about the videos that we make, about lesbians, about penguins, um, just come and say hi. But um, thanks again, good night.